So, uh, Leslie Hazelton uh, is a writer, psychologist, and a Stranger Genius Award winner. Her latest book is Agnostic, A Spirited Manifesto, which is her 13th book. She arrived in Seattle in 1992 via London, Jerusalem, and New York, got her pilot's license, settled into a houseboat, and realized this was a great place to write. When she's not booking it, she casts an agnostic eye on politics, religion, and existence at theaccidentaltheologist.com. She's joining us today straight from the TED Summit stage in Banff. Um, I think she may have just gotten off the plane fairly recently, so uh, we're really appreciative of her taking the time and putting in the effort to come and talk to us today. Please join me in welcoming Leslie Hazelton to our stage. There's a laptop in here. <laughs> I'm kind of pushing it aside. I'm technically incompetent, which is why one of the things I intend to do today is find out how to uh, do that live feed thing on Facebook from my phone. Because my hero of today is Diamond Reynolds. Diamond Reynolds is the woman who, as her boyfriend was dying beside her with four police bullets in him, did that live Facebook feed, which you can find online. If you go to media, you'll generally find it's just, quote-unquote, highlights. I urge you to find it online. By the way, I, it's on my Facebook page and it's also on my Twitter feed, because um, that full 10 minutes is devastating. And I should point out here that the two words she uses most often are please and sir. Um, yeah, so we could do with a little love, couldn't we? That we could do with some soul. So that's what I'm going to be talking about, is soul. Uh, <laughs> it's a weird segue, isn't it? <sighs> From police shooting and then five dead cops today in Dallas. It's just... Mm. Okay, soul. Oh, I can't move around. Gotcha. Is that working now? Okay. Well, I'm not sure exactly how old I was when I first heard about soul, but since I was in a convent school, I'm assuming it was kind of early. Uh, I'd call it soul talk, but even then, as a kid, I kind of realized there was something peculiarly soulless about it. Um, none of the nuns... But they did pray a lot for lost ones. And since I was the only Jew in the school, <laughs> I was given to understand that I might be one of those who'd been so careless as to lose hers. And the fact that I didn't know what it was only seemed proof of this. I was, as you can tell, a sort of peculiarly logical child. So the best I could come up with was something like Peter Pan's shadow. I don't know if you remember from Peter Pan when his shadow gets snapped off. It's either... Mr. Darling, I can't believe he called that family Darling, the Darlings. <laughs> so it was either Mr. Darling or Mrs. Darling came into the Darling Kids nursery when Peter Pan was there. Peter Pan makes a dash for it through the window. They, of course, the grown-up Darlings, kind of like the Muggles, can't see him. And uh, whoever it is, the Mr. or the Mrs., slams the window shut and cuts off his shadow. And this was just, I mean, he was in deep mourning for his shadow. And then when Wendy sewed it back on again, because, of course, this was written in uh, 1911, and Wendy, being the girl, was the only one who could sew, uh, um, huge relief and gratitude when Wendy sewed it back on again. But in any case, what I got from this was not the sewing bit. I've never been much good at sewing. But I did get that um, to lose your shadow was a really terrible thing. And so for a while... I kept looking behind me to make sure mine was still there, you know. So, oh. <laughs> and uh, has anyone here read Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, the psychoanalyst? Um, he, uh, he thought of the unconscious as the shadow aspect, quote unquote. So you'll see that he would have highly approved of this young version of me. But he probably wouldn't have approved of my next step because, uh, you know, logical child that I was, I decided to test my shadow. 
And uh, I was going to try and confuse it, even shake it off, by turning around really, really fast and seeing if it was still there, seeing if I could lose it, confuse it. You have to bear in mind that my experimental conditions weren't the best since this was in England. <laughs> even summer days tend to be kind of uh, cloudy. But um, I did persist, uh, add persistence to my sense of logic. And uh, I did discover that even though my shadow kept shifting shape, it remained stubbornly attached to me. It was kind of like mine and yet not mine, visible and yet intangible. Do you see where I'm going here? <laughs> so a few years later, a uh, couple of years later, when I began reading ghost and vampire stories and scaring the shit out of myself, I, <laughs> I found it oddly satisfying to realize that ghosts were once called shades and that vampires were said to cast no shadows, which I took to mean that at least I wasn't a vampire. Uh, but my soul, to the extent that it was allowed I might still have one, remained kind of elusive. And many years later, many years later, it still does. Which is why I've been trying to figure out recently what we really talk about when we talk about soul. I mean, we use the word so much, you'd think we'd have a handle on it. We talk of beautiful souls, lost souls. <laughs> soul food. Uh, and yet the more we talk, <coughs> the greater the risk of falling into cliché, however well-meaning. Actually, cliché usually is well-meaning. There's an easy sentimentality to the idea of someone being soulful, for instance. Oh, in the way my Irish mother used to forgive a rather tiresome acquaintance by saying, oh, but she's a good soul. Um, there's the pull, that is, of chicken soup for the soul territory. Because soul is a soft concept. Be hard-headed about soul? Might as well try being hard-headed about puppies. Uh, not that this has stopped lots of people from trying, nonetheless. Descartes, for instance, he of I think, therefore I am, thought that soul was a physical entity embedded in the pineal gland which happens to be conveniently located right here in the center of the brain. And a certain Massachusetts country doctor once claimed to have actually weighed the soul as it left the body at death. Three quarters of an ounce, he said. But since that didn't exactly roll off the tongue, popular legend went instead for the metric equivalent, 21 grams which some of you might remember from a few years back as the title of a soul-searching movie, sorry, couldn't resist, by Alejandro González Iñárritu. But in fact, whole bodies used to be thought of as souls. Or rather, the body was incidental, and the soul was all that mattered. There wasn't a soul in sight, someone might say, of an empty, lifeless street. And all souls were lost at sea statement that still makes me shiver, along with the distress call SOS, save our souls. The long arm of church doctrine at work here, reaching deep, even going so far as to insist obscenely that a life lost could be a soul found, which is, by the way, exactly what ISIS claim when they kill other Muslims who are in fact the vast majority of their victims. Basically, they're saying, we're doing you a favor by killing you for the sake of your soul, which is what I mean by obscenity. But here's the thing. What if we were to reclaim soul from the lost and found business? If we were to free it of pious modifiers such as blessed and immortal, because it hasn't always been the exclusive province of religion. You were waiting for the goose, here it is. <laughs> Back when the wealthy ate goose for supper, goose, uh, the bird's lungs were called the soul. And to the medieval palate, they were the finest delicacy. And the word is still used for the sound post of a violin, which is a small peg hidden right underneath the bridge, which transmits the vibration of the strings to the body of the instrument. 
the soul is what allows the violin to resonate, to reach out into the world. What then if we were to reach out too? If we were to let go of that the, that very definite article, and quit thinking in terms of the soul as though it were a thing, some interior component like a sound post. If we were to conceive of it instead as a quality of existence. Soul, that is, not as a part of you, not as a possession, not as a part of you that lives on after death or that could be lost or sold or weighed, whether in church or in the lab. Uh, in fact, not as a part of you at all, but as a dimension of being. I think of this as an agnostic approach to soul. In fact, it's where I, I ended up with this book, the, my last book, Agnostic. Agnostic. A Spirited Manifesto review is in, I think, this coming Sunday's New York Times book review. And it's a lovely one. It calls it mischievous, which I just, I love that. <laughs> I take that huge compliment. Um, <laughs> I think of this as an agnostic approach to soul. An existentialist one, if you like. A way to open out the idea and give it room to breathe. Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you, Asa. Now, that in itself sounds like it might be a good idea, right? But I've been told I, sh I, I shouldn't make comments like this last one. In fact, I was told it just last week at, in rehearsal at the TED Summit conference in Banff, where uh, during rehearsal, I, and if you didn't yet realize it, those, those talks are rehearsed up the wazoo, right? The speaking coach, I'd never actually encountered a speaking coach before. <laughs> I didn't quite see the purpose of it since this was 24 hours before I went on stage. Suggested, she suggested that I was using too much meta-commentary. I love that word, meta-commentary. Commenting on what I just said, that is. Questioning what I just said. Poking fun at myself. But uh, as you might gather, I enjoy meta-commentary. And hell, I, did. I was talking about soul, which seems to me to demand a degree of awareness. I guess you might call it meta-awareness. Meta-awareness? Wariness? Something like that. Uh, so as you don't get sucked down into that huge pot of chicken soup. Really what I had was a kind of anti-TED talk, because I was kind of questioning on stage instead of claiming expertise and answers. And of course, in the event, I went ahead and committed the worst meta-commentary of all by laughing out loud at something I planned to say straight-faced. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you in a while what that line was. And of course, you know, you're never meant to laugh at your own jokes on stage. Actually, anywhere. But in fact, I'm hoping they leave that laughter in when the talk goes online, which probably is in September, though I kind of suspect they'll edit it out because it wasn't scripted. But the fact is that I need to keep challenging what I've just said because not only do I not have answers, I, I don't really want them because that's how I think. I think in questions, following them, seeing where they lead, enjoying the journey, right? No sense of urgency, no need to reach a goal, a destination. And in, in fact, I think I'd be kind of disappointed if I did reach a goal, a destination, an answer because then the journey would be over. So when I talk about soul, it's an exploration, an investigation. And um, that really, I confess now, okay, I should be aware. <laughs> I once wrote a book called Confessions of a Fast Woman. And um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it was about cars. <laughs> but I remember then somebody warning me, be wary of what you confess to in public, which of course, since I was warned, I totally ignore. So I, I have a confession to make right now which is that one reason why I'm here is that I'm asking for your help because I'm wondering if there's a book to be written here. And I really don't know. I'm thinking a short book called something like Soul, an investigation, Soul, a reclamation, Soul. If you have better ideas, which I'm sure you do because I'm lousy at titles, please, you know, I'm leaving plenty of room at the end for, you know, discussion. Um, so I'd, I'd love your feedback, your suggestions, your ideas, your reactions, including, if such be your reaction, Leslie, just forget about it, right? 
Because um, I'm perfectly aware that, you know, I don't know, I don't know. And I, I, I'd love to know what you think, if, if this is worth pursuing, if there's a here, here. <laughs> Or if I'm just indulging in quasi-philosophical fantasy and, and, and should leave what I have sort of in a drawer in you know, one of those files ominously, at least for me, ominously titled Miscellaneous, which means I never open them again. Um, and if I shouldn't move on to something more tangible. Right, so that was you know, one long meta comment. Yeah, meta comments. <laughs> Thank you. So let's get back to soul and the idea of opening out the idea and giving it room to breathe. Yes, breathe, that's the word he reacts to. Breathe, <laughs> didn't work that time. <laughs> okay, but then the question is, how? <laughs> and there's a problem or two here. Address the sense of soul directly and it slips through your fingers like sand. Ask what's meant by saying that someone's got soul, and what comes to mind, or at least what comes to my mind, is that old advertising slogan. You know which one I'm thinking of? Got milk? Soul is something you can get. Something that's good to have. Of course, you could always fall back on a whole checklist of attributes such as generosity, genuineness, empathy, compassion, authenticity, these do all sound kind of solemn, almost reverent. Not that they're not vital, they are. And yet, vitality is exactly what they seem to lack when listed this way. It's as though they're weighed down by earnestness, grounded by gravity, which might be why a sense of humor is absent from that list. So I find myself thinking of other ways to talk about soul. Like, we remember, you know, when we talk of a place having soul, a place, like in one of those articles that's, you know, intended to be provocative with a headline like, Has Seattle Lost Its Soul? It's a rhetorical question, of course, because it's based on the elitist assumption that if you have to ask, the answer is yes. Um, in fact, it's what journalists used to call a thumbsucker, an old standby to fill column inches otherwise known as a yawn, because it makes you yawn. Mm. But it does address something important. That is, it could address something important. It really does. And that's the feel of a place. That ornery mix of qualities that defy easy categorization, like in PowerPoint packs and so on. Yet they're what make a place feel unique, make it feel like home. And it, this can't be measured by the usual quality of life factors, you know, those quality of life things they have, ranking cities, etc. Where the Seattle always ranks high, by the way. Um, such as transportation, services, you know, convenience. It's, this speaks to something beyond measurement, way beyond measurement, in a different world, as it were. It speaks to the sense of being invited in instead of being closed out to the feeling of being able to relate to a place, having a connection with it, feeling like we, we belong to it, we're part of it, we contribute to it, which is something of the feeling, I think, that we get right here, right now, or Creative Mornings. And there's um, a weathered sense to this sense of soul. And when I use the word weathered, you might gather from a somewhat weathered face, I use it as a compliment. Uh, the designers among you will surely disagree, or maybe not, but I'm not sure you can achieve this with newness, this sense of soul. Uh, I think of a worn old leather sofa, one that's been beaten up in repeated moves from one home to another, that's been clambered over by generations of kids and sort of totally scratched up by long forgotten cats. The kind of sofa you can sink into with your shoes on. One that you can stretch out on. One that welcomes you just as you are. A, the kind of sofa that would never make the pages of Architectural Digest. And that anyone staging a house for sale would get moved out of their ASAP. And as you probably guessed, I once did have such a sofa. Well, I kind of had it. Um, it was a brown one, and it was worn 
I wore nearly white in places, and I had to leave it behind when I left Jerusalem, and I still miss it. it the one I have now I bought in, uh, what, uh, 30 years ago. It's a dark green one, and I bought it in New York, and it's still got another 30 years to go before it reaches full weatheredness, but you know, it's on its way. So this is what I love. That was a meta comment on sofas. Never mind. <laughs> this is what I love about soul. The usual measures of value and status and achievement do not apply. Soul is democratic. Someone with little or no schooling may have soul, while another with multiple advanced degrees may seem kind of lacking in it. A woman who's never set foot beyond her mountain village may have soul, as may a quadriplegic unable to set foot anywhere at all while the most well-traveled, physically daring adventurer may seem kind of in need of some. So I think most of us are perhaps best acquainted with this sense of soul in terms of music. You know where I'm going here, right? Soul music. Because if soul could be said to have a heart, this surely goes right to it. Right? Think Nina Simone, Aretha Franklin, Music the voices deep pain, yet somehow transforms that pain into beauty by kind of alchemy. It makes the bitter into the hauntingly bittersweet, even somehow into joy. And yet couldn't it be said that all great music is really soul music? Music that moves you, that is, sometimes literally so that I might find myself dancing to, to, to a Beethoven symphony or to the ecstatic Sufi chanting of Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan. Because music is not only an expression of soul, it's a carrier of it, which is why it's so often banned by fundamentalist regimes. Soul does not sit well with dogma. That's why it would be tempting to say here that fundamentalists are soulless. Make that very tempting. Except, is that really possible? Only if you still think of the soul as a, as a thing, a possession. I mean, I can see how a soul could conceivably be owned or lost, stolen, even sold as in a Faustian pact. But the quality of soul is not a tradable commodity. So it's not that some people have no soul, but that something in them seems to have shriveled, it seems to have turned in on itself as though in, in retreat. And they've hunkered down and built a wall around themselves, sometimes even a physical wall of steel or concrete, afraid of what's beyond, of the unknown, the other. They close the gates and post guards. They live walled off from the world, and even at the extreme, against the world. And if the gates were to be kept open, could soul be a matter of being brave enough to be vulnerable, to, to acknowledge the risks of being vulnerable, that is, and willingly accept them nonetheless, because risks they are. And those I think of as brave souls know this. In a way, they're the personification of soul music. However bitter their experience, they're not ruled by fear or by resentment. They, they reach out into the world instead of being guarded against it. They're open to it. Could we think then in terms of being open-souled and closed-souled? Sounds promising open and closed soul, and yet mm, there's still something missing, isn't there? There's some spark, some sense of energy, of life, of love of life. It, I, knew, I knew love was going to get here. I mean, it really is about love, love of life. But since I'm what you might call a stubborn soul, uh, let me try one last time for now. Because you know, those medieval diners, remember them? the ones eating goose for supper, they may have been on to something when they called the lungs of the goose the soul. The lungs, the breath of life. 
And if the connection isn't quite there in English, that's the line I couldn't deliver at Banff. <laughs> I mean, for a writer. Oh, no, no, it isn't. The connection isn't quite there. It, yes, sorry. Got it all wrong. If the connection isn't quite there in English, it could be that English just isn't a very soulful language. <laughs> that's when I burst out laughing, because I mean, for a writer to say that the language he writes in is not a very soulful language is just too wonderfully, completely absurd, and yet, I suspect, true. Um, <laughs> in any case, if the connection isn't quite there in English, it does exist in many other languages, like in Arabic and Hebrew, which use related words such as nafis and nefesh, which can mean either breath or soul or spirit, or all three. And there it is, I think. There's what's been missing. Spirit. That sense of vitality. Isn't that what we need when we talk about soul? We need to make it spirited again. Give it some guts again. Give it lungs again. Because if we want to live life with soul, and I'm pretty sure most of us do, we need to breathe life back into it. Thank you. <laughs> And now, I've got my pen ready because I really, really do want to hear back from you. I mean, is this, am I wasting my time here? I mean, the, uh, the soul comes up at the very end of this book, you know, and I was just, and very often one book begins with the end of another without my even realizing it. But I really don't know, is there a there there? Especially when I'm talking about something where there is no there there, or may not be any there there. <laughs> so I'd, I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah. When we talk about soul, how do you see that related to the concept of being in the Oh. Uh, how, so. Okay, it was David asking a question. He says, when I talk about soul, how do I see it as related to the concept of faith? I don't really. I think you can be the most faithless pagan unbeliever in the world and still be full of soul. I think you can be the most faithful, dogmatic believer and have no bloody soul at all, as we see with ISIS and so on. Um, I think this goes beyond. You know, the concept of soul has been sort of um, taken over by the church. It didn't start that way. It just started as a philosophical concept. I'm not going to bore you with Aristotle and Plato and so on, but it did start very much as a philosophical concept. Um, they're now trying to take it over. Psychologists are now trying to take it over as a psychological concept by simply replacing it with another four-letter word, which is mind. But it goes way beyond mind. Um, so what I, you know, I really do want to reclaim it from the clutches of the church and the mosque and the synagogue because I think it's too important to leave to religion, the sense of soul. It uh, goes to something very deeply human in us, and, uh, which is what religion should go to, but far too often does not. Yeah. That's fascinating. I know, it's terrible, isn't it? I, I think, except for little hints here and there. Um, yeah, consciousness. There's a lot being written about consciousness. And that, that consciousness is magnificent. I'm not talking about the kind of consciousness that, you know, sort of you know, reaction to pain and so on and so on. I'm talking about, sorry to use the 
<laughs> phrase again, but meta consciousness, the awareness of being conscious. I mean, you can look at the whole of philosophy, the whole history of philosophy, as the history of men, and you know, th until recently they have been, sorry, mainly men, just sitting there in absolute astonishment to the very fact that they can think, <laughs> and trying to figure out how did this happen, right? And the wonderful thing is that there are no answers for all the advances in neuroscience and so on. We have still not the faintest idea of any kind of causal or, or, or cause and effect connection, physical connection between how the brain works, between neuroscience and this amazing fact that, we, that we're aware of who we are, right? Or most of us, at least, are aware of who we are. Um, it's, uh, it's magnificent. And it's just, it, 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 it's, it's totally, totally an enigma, and I think a totally fascinating one. So, when I, I do use the word consciousness, but I sort of, in the sense of that meta-consciousness, which I think is so fascinating, um, the awareness of being aware, the consciousness of being conscious, and then with all that, the reflection, okay, what does this mean? What is my responsibility as a human being, right, to the world near and far in the world and I think the greater the greater that sense of meta awareness the more spirit there is without it being I don't mean I don't mean the sort of like 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 the superego you know where, you're, where you're, you're just constantly sort of criticizing and so on but the sense of yourself as an active agent in the world as reaching out to it as wanting more of the world instead of being like this against it and so on um, I'm getting at something here, I'm still not quite sure what I'm getting at, which is why I, I don't even know if I should pursue this any further, you know, because it's, I'm, I'm floundering, I'm floundering for words, and yet I kind of sense at the same time that it's really important somehow that I find them. But thanks for engaging on that level, on all three of those levels. Yeah. Well, there's no chance of it being anything but meandering if it's me doing it. <laughs> but say that again, the last bit, some sense of what? How to get it. How to get it. Yeah. Of opening up, yeah. Of relaxing into it, I don't know. It's almost like how to get rhythm, isn't it? <laughs> That's something I also yeah. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> I once had a friend, I remember once, oh, this was back in the disco days, right? Okay, long time ago. But I went to a disco with a friend who said she can't, cannot, cannot, cannot dance. Um, so, okay, mayor called her, I fed her a couple of brandies. There's very, there's very few people I know who can dance that well when she got going. Sorry, you were? Um, I don't think I have a whole lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> It was only a couple of brandies. <laughs> I see. I don't know. <laughs> Not drunk, as that sort of you know that 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 when you're in the middle there, when you're just kind of like you know, a little bit high, just the right amount of high, you know. <laughs> okay, there was one. Uh, sorry, she was she was first. I think. I'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah, just sometimes it's kind of hidden and closed, and sometimes, it's, yeah, that was my point too. Um, it's interesting because I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I was originally a psychologist, you know, and, and you never actually, yeah, yeah. 
So you probably realize, you know, you never actually stop being a psychologist. You may think you've left it far, but, you know, it's like being a lapsed Catholic. You know, if you read Graham Greene, you'll know there's nobody more Catholic than a lapsed Catholic because they're wrestling with it all the time, right? So being a lapsed psychologist is a, it's a, I don't know. No, I, I, I do think it goes beyond issues of personality. Though that is a factor in it, but just that, um, goes to something very deeply human. Uh, I don't know. I have to think about that, but thanks. We, if you write a book, then I think you can analyze the sort of relation between personality and soul. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Huh. But should I write it? <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm just, it's this, I'm, I'm, I'm on, am I on a fool's errand here? You know, I, I'm, I'm willing to make a fool of myself in public, but uh, not to spend a couple of years doing it, right? <laughs> yeah, there's somebody here. What was that? I don't know. Huh. Huh. I'm sorry, it takes me time to write. I don't do shorthand. Mm. The word that comes to mind right now is comfort, as in being comfortable. I mean, you know, I think, for instance, of the courthouse of Chop House Row, right, which is that, that mix of old and new. And I know it's a fake mix, and I know it's so on and so on, but it works, right? There's enough old there to make me feel comfortable, to make me feel like I actually am walking through an alley and so on. It's... Um, and there's something appealing about it. Without those elements of old, it would be just be kind of cold and unwelcoming. So there's, there's, there's a warmth, warmth and cold thing going on here. Um, is there such a thing as an accidental soul? I love that since I, you know, I blog as the accidental theologist. I love the idea of the accidental soul. Um, can we deliberately make soul? Can we deliberately create soul? Uh, I think, uh, well, there's a whole branch of, there is a branch of soul psychology, isn't there? Uh, James Hillman and so on, who would say yes, but it's not actually so much creating soul as liberating it, which is, of course, the aim of most good psychotherapy is to liberate from whatever's hanging you up, from whatever's holding you back and so on. Um, so can it be created? I mean, can it be made? I would... I would, I would say no, that it is something inside us that just, you know, do we have the guts to go with it? Do we have the, it, it is a matter of being vulnerable too, of being open. And you know, it's not like, I mean, occasionally, I mean, who are the people you think of as brave souls? I mean, they're ones, they, they take enormous risks and they, and yet they seem sort of like, almost, not that they're unaware that they're taking those risks, but they, it, there's a kind of, acceptance of the risk, you know, and, and, and there's a calmness goes with that, which I hugely admire because the one of the many things I lack is calmness. Um, but it's, um, I don't know, 
something that needs exploring more. There's just something going on here between the three of you that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Lady in yellow there. She's sorry. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, most definitely, and you're right. In fact, that's one of the things that most uh, surprised me, one of the reactions to uh, this book. Agnostic was um, a friend who is Buddhist, read it, loved it, and said, Leslie, I have to tell you something. I think you've only used the word Buddhist once in this book, but it's one of the most deeply Buddhist books I've ever read. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of the places I would definitely have to go. Uh, you know, I know I'm writing for a Western audience, so it has to be, well, obviously you're very well aware of that sort of, how do you do that sort of philosophical, cultural, not translation, transition, tra there's a word that means bringing it all together, but I'm sorry, I'm out of words and out of time right now, so thank you. Oh, can I just, Please, please ask for a quick vote. Anyone who thinks I'm wasting my time should forget about it. Please, I'm, I won't hold it against you. Just put your hands up very, very quickly. Oh, come on. <laughs> Somebody there has got to think I'm just... <laughs> okay, anybody thinks I should definitely pursue this and write a book about it? Oh, my God. Okay, any of you who absolutely, therefore, totally promise to buy it when I do it? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>